Let me start by welcoming the AU students who are here, uh, the law students for NIU, including my oldest girl. It's her birthday today. Um, <laughs> members of the bar, members of the law enforcement community who are here, I appreciate that, particularly my friends Lee and Kristen, who when the department chair told me that I'm responsible for this place being in good condition when I leave, I called Lee. And he fell for the, you doing anything next Tuesday? Because I, yeah. no, what do you have in mind? Um, before I go any further, I also want to thank uh, Dave Dial. This is being recorded, the best department chair anywhere, who's my boss. <laughs> and Dr. Stephanie Wittius, who's on the faculty here in the criminal justice department and just did a lot to get this ready for me today. Thank you very much, doctor. I see folks looking for seats. There's one yeah. On February 25th, 1983, almost 34 years ago to the day, Janine Nicarico, 10, was at home alone in her home in Naperville. Someone broke into that home, wrapped her up, kidnapped her, sexually assaulted her, and murdered her. The DuPage County Sheriff's Office began their investigation. And I can tell you from personal experience, one of the first things they did is go to the Aurora Police Department, where I happened to be the police officer on the front desk, and they wanted to know if our investigators in, because they knew whoever did this came from Aurora. I said, why does it have to come from Aurora? Well, we just know it did. The Sheriff's Office began their investigation, and it took a while. But there was an election coming up, and it was a heated election because of the person who wanted to be the state's attorney in DuPage County. The investigation was pushed, either directly or indirectly, it's always hard to say. There were errors, there were malfeasance, there was mistakes. On March 9th, 1984, three men, Rolando Cruz, Alejandro Hernandez, and Stephen Buckley were indicted for her murder. For the next decade and more, this case involving a criminal justice system took twists and turns that sometimes are not to be believed, or at least we would hope would not believe, be believed. But unfortunately, these type of errors are occurring with more frequency than they were before. Mr. Hernandez was convicted and sentenced to death, along with Mr. Cruz. Mr. Buckley, who was tried separately and was represented by Mr. Johnson, was not convicted. He had a hung jury. Eventually, Mr. Johnson was able to make sure that case wasn't prosecuted again, based on his work. In 1985, the same year they were convicted, a man named Brian Dugan was arrested for a series of murders. Brian's public defender, and his team of public defenders, which eventually included Mr. McCulloch, at some point proffered or made information to the state's attorney that, you know, you've got these guys charged with this murder. I think maybe we've got the right guy. Dugan had already been arrested for several unrelated attacks, a couple of murders. Mr. Cruz was tried again and sentenced to death again, 1990. His first conviction was overturned because they tried two co-defendants together. They were sentenced to death. Mr. Cruz's conviction was overturned. He was then sentenced to death again. Uh, Alejandro Hernandez's conviction was overturned with Mr. Cruz. His next trial was a hung, trial, a hung jury, and then he was sentenced to death again. Mr. Cruz's was, case was ultimately reversed on Bastille Day, 1994. I thought that was interesting. He was ultimately acquitted in 1995. Brian Dugan is on death row. I want to talk about our speakers briefly. Mr. Johnson, my current partner, has been a lawyer for over 30 years. A graduate of Illinois Wesleyan, Drake University Law School, where he was awarded the Order of Coif for outstanding achievement. He was an assistant state's attorney in King County before this case started. After it was, he was elected the state's attorney of King County and since then he's been in private practice. He and I have been together about 20 years or so. Tom McCulloch is a present public defender in DeKalb County. 
Prior to that, he was an assistant public defender in Kane County. Prior to that, he was the public defender at Kane County. At one point, he was working part-time, and he worked with our firm. Mr. McCulloch also represented recently Jack McCulloch, who has been in the newspaper, DeKalb County murder conviction, a cold case homicide, that when, you, when he talks a little bit about it, he said he would talk what, about what he can a little bit. You'll see what we thought was over a couple of decades ago is not over. These type of mistakes still occur. Finally, this is my friend, our friend, Rolando Cruz. This is hard for Rolando to talk about. He was in prison for something he did not do for over a decade, much of it on death row, which I submit to you was not a pleasant place to be. Here's what's going to happen. I'm first going to ask Mr. Johnson to talk about the tortured history as he will share with you. And then Mr. McCulloch, and then finally we'll hear from Mr. Cruz. There will be time for questions at the end. If you would save them to them, that would be great. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Johnson. Speaking to the uh, seniors that are here, I'm assuming you're seniors and probably juniors in, in college. What would, year would you be born? 1995, is that, am I close? Am I fairly close? Okay, 1995. The events that I'm gonna talk to you about span 35 years, and, and David said to me, I want you to give us an overview of the Nicarico case. So I said, well, the Nicarico case went on for 30, and, and it, it's not still going on, but it, it didn't finish all that long ago. 35 years, there's been all kinds of litigation over the 35 years, civil suits, criminal suits, um, all kinds of things have happened. And today, as we sit here in 2017, things are good. Rolando Cruz is a free man. The two other, uh, the two other people that he was charged with, Stephen Buckley, who's my client, who likes to fly under the radar and is not here tonight, and Alex Hernandez, they're free men. Uh, Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley all sued the county at one point during this entire 35-year period, sued the county and, and won a multi-million dollar verdict. It wasn't enough, but it, it helps. It was something. Some of the prosecutors and some of the police that were in charge of investigating and prosecuting this case were charged with various obstruction of justice related crimes. They were all acquitted. As you know, it's difficult to prosecute police officers and, and, and prosecutors, but they were all acquitted. Uh, and that happened during the course of this 35 years. There were a number of criminal cases as well. There were libel suits. All kinds of things have happened over the 35 years. And things are good today. The, the good guys are out. The innocent guys are out. The person who committed this crime, the only person who committed this crime, Brian Dugan, is serving a life sentence in prison. He's actually serving three life sentences right now. I think. Tom, they're consecutive, right? So unless he's a cat, what? He, what? No, they are Three, they are consecutive. Okay, unless he's a cat. 265 years. You've heard, well, you've heard that cats have what? Nine lives, three lives? Anyway, he's got six left. In any event, but it didn't start out very pretty. It started out kind of rough. And on February 25th, as David told you, February 25th, 1983, Janine Nicarico was taken from her home in Naperville, Illinois. Now you have to. I always say to people there were no Nicarico cases before the Nicarico case because we hadn't had anything like this before. And it was every, every parent's and brother's and sister's worst nightmare. Mom and dad worked. Dad goes off to work. Mom worked as a secretary in a nearby elementary school. Her daughter Janine is sick. They, she had two older daughters who went off to school. Mom's debating whether to stay home or go to work. She decides to go to work. She leaves some instructions on how to not answer the door or answer the door to Janine, and she's calling in all day as a worried mom would do. At some point during the day, Janine is taken from her home, and uh, she is sodomized, and there, they find semen uh, on her and in her. She's uh, uh, beaten over the head and she's not found for two days. She's dead and they find her on February 27th on the Illinois Prairie Path, which is a path, I don't know if you've ever been on it, but it's a path and off there's some woods off to the side. They find her naked body and uh, basically gash, beat in head and, all, and now there's an investigation. And we're not talking about any investigation because this actually, even though 
the address is Naperville. It happened like a block outside of the city limits in Naperville. So it was a DuPage County Sheriff's Department jurisdiction. The Sheriff's Office takes uh, over this case, but they enlist the help of the Naperville Police Department, the Aurora, as Mr. Kamek told you, the Aurora Police Department, and even the FBI got involved, and they had this task force, and they're turning the world up on, you know, on its ear to try to find out whoever committed this crime. And David's right, the first place they looked was west. It had to come from uh, Aurora. And they started looking west. And one of the things that they did that I think is a, an argument for ever having rewards in a, in a criminal case is they offered a reward that started out at $5,000. It was increased to $10,000. Now, I don't know what it, that amounts to in today's money, but I bet you it's pretty close to twenty-five, thirty, maybe even more, th maybe $50,000, something like that. And what it does is it causes young men to do stupid things and say stupid things. And so as the investigation started out, uh, Alex Hernandez is the first one to open his mouth. And he tells, starts telling his family members that he had been talking to a fellow by the name of Ricky Benavidez. Ricky Benavidez was uh, somebody they couldn't find. He said, I was talking to a guy by the name of Ricky Benavides, and he said he had something to do with the killing of Janine Nicarico. So when the Naperville police and the, or I'm sorry, the sheriff's office hears this, they go out to Alex and they talk to him and they say, tell us about what you heard. And he said, well, I was in a car with Ricky Benavides, and Ricky Benavides says that they didn't mean to kill her and that he was involved and all that. So right now they're thinking Alex is a suspect. And Alex hears about the reward and he starts thinking I'm gonna do some things to get the reward. So he starts, spewing out garbage, things that lying to the police officers and spewing out garbage that the police caused them to be suspicious of him. And when they said, where's Ricky Benavides? Nobody could find Ricky Benavides. And so they're trying to find him. They said, well, who was present with you? Was anybody else there when you talked about Ricky Benavides? He said, yeah, there was a couple of guys. Mike Castro, who they found, who said no, no such conversation occurred in my presence. And Stephen Buckley, who they also found, and they said, uh, and Steve said to them when they talked to him, and he talked to him, he said, and I, I don't remember any, con there was no conversation like that, so, you know, it didn't happen. What they did do to Steve, though, they said, you know, where there's a shoe print on the door, because the Nicarico Court door was kicked in, and there was a shoe print on the door. And it had a pattern on it, and you could see it. And so they said to Steve, do you ever see, and they found out what kind of a shoe makes that print, so they showed him a shoe while they were questioning him. He said, have you ever seen a shoe like that? And Steve says, I have a shoe that's just like that. So they go over to the Nicarico house, I'm sorry, they go over to the Buckley house, and Mrs. Buckley, Steve says, Mom, they want my shoes. Mrs. Buckley takes Steve's shoes, wraps them up in a little bag, and gives them to the police, and they go off to the DuPage County Crime Lab. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the shoe print evidence in detail in a minute, but the shoe print evidence is if you took a look at the bottom of Steve's shoe, if you took a look at the bottom of that shoe and you looked at the shoe print on the door, you'd say, well, there's a clue because the patterns look similar. You can say, okay, uh, we should take a look at that shoe and, and analyze that and see if that shoe has any connection to the door because it looks like it's the same brand of shoe that was used to kick in the door. Then Rolando gets involved. He hears about the, uh, the uh, um, uh, reward as well, and he starts saying some crazy things. Uh, not as crazy as Alex does, but he, gets he starts saying things too, and they start homing in on Rolando. And there's a couple of dates I want you to remember with Rolando Cruz, because I'm going to tee this up for him. I, I know he's going to talk about it, but there's two dates I want you to remember, because I'm going to connect it up with the third date later on. And uh, Janine was taken in February, nine, I'm sorry, February 25th, 1983. On May 2nd, 1983, and on May 10th, 1983, and those are two important dates, keep those in mind, they interview, interview Rolando Cruz, and whenever Rolando talked to him, something or somebody was there to record it, right? They put a microphone under him and he talks. On May the 2nd, they do that. May the 10th, they do that. And there was a, there was, I saw, read the transcript of the statements that Rolando made. And basically those statements were, I talked to a guy who knows something about the case. And they go on, he goes on for a little while talking about that. So I know a guy by the name of Emilio Donatlin. He knows about the case. He knows who killed Janine Nicarico. And then on the 10th, it was somebody else who we mentioned. And those two dates happened. They drag him before the grand jury as they drag Steve Buckley and as they drag Alex Hernandez before the grand jury. By now these guys are knowing, well, these guys are thinking we had something to do with this. What the hell's going on here? And they're saying we didn't have anything to do with this. Alex is saying in front of the grand jury, I did this for the, I did this, I talked to you guys for the money. I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. All through this time, there's a detective over at the sheriff's office. 
His name is John Sam, and John Sam is one of what I consider one of four heroes in this case. And John Sam is looking at these things. He says, you know, I just have a funny feeling that Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley didn't have anything to do with it. I'm usually pretty good at getting statements out of people, and we've grilled them, we've talked to them. I think Alex Hernandez is full of shit. I think Rolando Cruz is full of shit, and I think Steve Buckley had nothing to do with this. I don't think that's his shoe. Again, I'm going to talk about the shoe in a minute. Well, as time goes by, so we go through all through 1983 and we go into 1984 and there's an, in March in DuPage County there's a primary election and in, if you know anything about DuPage County, the primary election is the election. There is no general election. Democrats are, uh, all six of them live I think in Addison somewhere. In any event, the, the, the Republican primary is it and the current state's attorney and the old, and, uh, and a uh, defense lawyer, they go at it, they're going at it. And so Fitzsimmons, Mike Fitzsimmons, who was the state's attorney two weeks before the primary, indicts Buckley, Hernandez, and Cruz. And comes across like the white knight who uh, comes galloping through on his horse and he's, he claims he's got the right guys. And, and it starts out that way. And the entire, and, and the press was, uh, was horrible at the beginning. We see pictures of these three guys. It's Naperville, it's fairly, not very much in the way of minorities there. We've got Buckley, who's white, but we've got Rolando Cruz and Alex Hernandez, who are Latinos. And so, and, and you, can, you, can see that, you can see that there are Latinos in the newspaper, and then Steve Buckley, when he gets arrested, he gets his mugshot taken. He's got strep throat, and he looks horrible. So these three guys are sitting there, and every day I see that picture in the newspaper. I get, I'm in court one day, and uh, I'm, I'd been a state's attorney for a while, and I'm sitting in court doing civil work for a civil law firm, and I talked to a friend of mine named Cliff Lund. He says, how's your criminal practice coming? I said, you know, I'm have trouble getting it off the ground. I'm, I'm pretty busy doing civil stuff for this firm I'm with. He said, well, would you like a criminal case? I said, sure, that'd be great. And he says, boy, do I have a case for you. And, and all of a sudden, the next thing I know, within about two weeks, I'm representing Steve Buckley along with Cliff Lund. And I'm scared. I'm scared to death because I'd... The only defense I'd done in it before in my life was representing a guy in a DUI in Cook County. It was a bench trial. And uh, so I was nervous. Now, I, I don't want to mislead you. I, I was a, I'd been a prosecutor, and I'd prosecuted murder cases, but uh, I'd never defended anybody before. So I, I was kind of new at this, trying to figure out what to do. Cruz and Hernandez were represented by lawyers at the, at the public defender's office, and we start getting involved. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see how how the deck seems to be stacked against these guys. And I'm hearing rumors in, 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 from people that are, other than John Sam, who will talk to us, but I'm starting to hear rumors that a lot of people in the, in the, in the criminal justice community are questioning whether they have the right guys. And uh, I talked to some DuPage County, or some Kent County sheriffs who had transported people back and forth over to Kent. They were saying, Something's funny is going on over there. I don't know what, what's happening, but I, I just keep your eyes open, Gary. And then I hear that John Sam, who is a deputy sheriff, one of the head investigators in this thing, is not believing that any of these three guys did it. And he makes the mistake of telling anybody who will listen. You, you, he says, you got the wrong three guys. And he tells his boss, and he tells everybody, and his boss tells him, you can't rock the boat. We've got our three guys. And he's saying, no, I think you got the wrong guys. I think you should stop this train before it gets too far down the tracks. And they wouldn't stop it. And the next thing you know, John Sam is, uh, is transferred. I think he's trying to bust underage drinkers at the convenience stores or something. They send him out and, and he's, he's, he eventually then, after a while, shortly thereafter, uh, resigns from police work and he hasn't been a police officer since and he was, as far as I'm concerned, DuPage County just cheated themselves out of a hell of an investigator. But in any, in any event, we go to trial, and they actually were all tried together. All three of them were tried together. It was a seven-week trial. It was, if it wasn't the longest state trial in Illinois history, it was one of them. It was a seven-week trial, and, and, and uh, Steve Buckley, we were fortunate enough to be able to get a hung jury on him. And I'm going to come back to the evidence on that in a second. And Alex and, and Rolando uh, were found guilty and got the death penalty. But I want to go back to over some of this evidence because I, I teased you with a couple things. There were a lot of things that went wrong that the, that, the, that the prosecutors did that I think were, as Mr. Kamek said, malfeasance. Some of it was intentional. intentional. Some of it uh, was just mistakes. Some of it was, I think, just the human nature of once you commit to something, once you commit to a theory, you don't want to change it. You don't want to think somebody else, you, you were wrong. You don't want to admit a mistake. A lot of things were, were working uh, with regard to that. 
One of the things we noticed is when I, when I took a look at this shoe, I, I looked at Steve's shoe, I, I got pictures of the shoe, I got uh, evidence from, uh, I got reports from the state shoe print experts. Their, their shoe print experts weren't very, uh, weren't very positive. They were saying Buckley shoe could have made the print. That was as strong as they got. So what they did was they went to this very questionable shoe print expert out in North Carolina. Her name was Dr. Louise Robbins. She was a forensic anthropologist. And she claimed she had this theory that the human shoe print was unique. So that if my shoes, I walk down here, nobody else like a fingerprint or like, my, or like DNA, my shoe print is unique and nobody else has a similar shoe print to me on the face of the earth. And she had this theory. And she was going around the country doing a lot of damage with this theory. And let me tell you what she did in another case in DuPage County. They found shoe prints at, at a murder scene. They found shoe prints and they had a suspect and they looked at this suspect and they couldn't find the shoes that made that print because the, the bottoms were different. They couldn't find the shoes but they found a bunch of other shoes and slippers. She took a look at those other shoes and said, the guy who made the sh this sh print on this shoe that had nothing to do with the crime is the same guy who made that shoe print that did have something to do with the crime. And so they charged this guy based on that and they got him convicted. And uh, we started hearing, I started hearing from forensic anthropologists as well as other people in the uh, shoe print co comparison industry, forensic shoe print comparison. They were saying, this woman's full of baloney. You can't make a, you can't make a positive identification based on, shoe, on wear patterns alone. There has to be something else. And what they're looking for is accidental characteristics on the bottom of a shoe. A manufactured characteristic, if you look at the bottom of your shoe and it has grooves in it and it has waves and whatever, it's gym shoes have them, sometimes other shoes have them. Those are manufactured characteristics. Accidental characteristics are if you step on a stone or a piece of glass or if you cut it or something like that. For them, for shoe print experts in this country today to make a positive ID, there has to be a connecting accidental characteristic or they won't commit that that shoe made that print. And so Louise Robbins was the only one in the, in the country and in the world that would go ahead and make that kind of a connection without accidental characteristics, and she did. She came back and said, Buckley shoe made the print on the door. I sent the shoes out, I got the shoes, I sent them out to my experts, and they call me back and they're looking at it, especially one who is a, a, also a forensic anthropologist at Kent State University, but the other ones called me back too and they said, Gary, look at, look at the bottoms of those shoes. They're different shoes, and I did. And you look at them, and they all they had a number of differences between the print and the bottom of Steve's shoe. There were a number of differences between the shoe and the print, but the one that impressed me the most was in the heel, because it had these arches. They were like uh, chucka boots. You know what chucka boots are? Those winter boots that kind of come pop over your ankle, maybe barely. And yeah, they had these arcs going on them. On on Steve's shoe, the arcs went uh, one way, and on the print, they went the other way. And none of the state's experts either recognized it or would acknowledge those opposite direction arcs to occur. Now these shoes were manufactured in 19 or 20 different cities across the world, in China and in Spain, Romania, all over the place. And each shoe manufacturer made a different, it was called a new silver cloud sole. Each of them made a tiny difference in the sole so that you could tell which, manufa which company manufactured it. And so I went out, Steve's shoes came from the, I don't know if you remember, Fav, uh, Payless, I'm sorry, the Payless shoe stores. His shoes came from Payless. I went to a Fava shoe store, I'm sorry, our investigator went to a Payless, uh, 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 Fava shoe store, and they, he bought some shoes at the, at, the, uh, Payless, at the Fava shoe store, and I looked at them, and they had the kind of heel markings that matched the markings on the door. So the Favas matched the markings on the door. And I'm thinking, okay, so my experts are right, they're different. And I talked to the manufacturer and he was telling me, yeah, they're all different. They're all, they all have these little differences, that doesn't surprise me a bit. And my expert said, well, that's just one of many differences between the shoe from Fava and, the, and your shoe and the print on the door. There's just a bunch of differences. There was an expert by the name of, uh, of uh, from the FBI, and I, I'm having trouble remembering his name, oh, uh, William Bodziak. Everybody says to me, my experts say to me, there is one expert in the country, his name is Bill Bodziak. Send the shoes off to him. Everybody says he's number one. I'll bet you he can solve this problem, because I, I, they are telling me, Gary, this guy's a straight shooter. I know he's with the FBI. He's a straight shooter. Send those shoes to the FBI, and he'll tell you that, that Steve's shoe did not make the print on that door. 
Well, it turns out the FBI won't look at evidence once another lab has looked at it. And in our case, a number of people had looked at that evidence. So Bojack refuses to look at the shoes. Before we go to trial, about a month before we go to trial, I get a call from Rolando's lawyer, Tom Laz. He's, all, he's out of breath. He's on the phone. Gary, 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 look at, look at the, you got to look at the reports. There's ink on the bottom of Steve's shoe. There's ink at the bottom of Steve's shoe. I go, what are you talking about? And so I look at the reports, and this ink at the bottom, on the bottom of Steve's shoes was evidence that Steve's shoe had been tested by somebody at the DuPage Crime Lab. And they never told me about it. I never got any information from the DuPage County Crime Lab. And so I start asking around, and somebody says, well, a fellow by the name of John Garaychek from the DuPage County Crime Lab was actually, if not the first, one of the very first guys to look at this shoe. And he came out and told anybody who would listen to him that Steve's shoe did not make the print on the door. Their clue was bad. And they basically took the shoes away from him, and they said, John, thanks for the information, but no thanks. We'll call you later if you're needed. And he was never heard from again. Now, what's important to know in this case is that prosecutors have an obligation. Because a prosecutors' jobs are a little bit different from defense lawyers' jobs. And prosecutors not only are not there just to gain a conviction, but they are there also to seek justice. And part, as a corollary that, if they ever find out any information that what we call tends to negate the guilt or mitigate the sentence of a defendant, they have to turn it over to the defense. I never got that information. Now, the state's attorney who handled the case said he didn't have the information. I personally don't believe him, but that's what he said. And even if he didn't have it, and I, and I think he did, but even if he didn't have it and the police held back, my, my thought was, why are you holding back a crucial piece of evidence in a case like this where you're seeking the death penalty against the guy? Why would you hold on to that evidence? So we go to trial, and I think it was that shoe print evidence that we, we were able to get our experts and John Garaychek to get on the stand. John Garaychek, the shoes were taken away from him so fast he, could, he couldn't write a report. He didn't remember why he excluded Steve's shoe as making the print on the door. He excluded it. He couldn't remember why. He just said, all I did was say it was, didn't make a match, and I wanted the shoes back so that I could tell everybody why. I'd show them all the points of difference, and they wouldn't give them back to him. They instead sent it off to these other experts who did what they did. We got a hung jury, and uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. This brings me to May 2nd and May the 10th. Rolando Cruz makes two statements, one on May 2nd, one on May the 10th. Complete bullshit statements, nothing, meaning nothing, garb all garbage. And as we're getting ready for trial, I'm sitting down with his lawyer, Tom Laz, and we're, we're talking about Tom says, and what, I, what do they have against my guy? I don't know what they have. I don't think they have anything against him. And a week before trial, they come up and they tell Tom, well, there's one more statement that we have neglected to tell you about. There was a statement that took place on May the 9th, they claimed. On May the 9th, and it's been, it's been, it's been uh, named the vision statement. They say on May the 9th, uh, Rolando made a statement uh, claiming he had a vision or a dream about something that had occurred that matched some of the facts of the case that they think would convict Rolando Cruz. And they gave it to Laz, and Laz says, well, Surely you recorded May 2nd and May 10th, you would have recorded May the 9th. And they said, no, there's no recording. He said, well, then give me a police report. They said, well, there was no police report either. They didn't so much as write it out down on the back of a cocktail napkin. And so they go to trial that, and I think on the strength of that vision, alleged vision statement, Rolando Cruz gets convicted, Alex Hernandez gets convicted, and we start getting ready for a retrial on Steve Buckley's case. Cliff and I withdraw from the case. The public defender takes over Steve's case. And as she's getting up to speed, I'm kind of helping the public defender from my office in St. Charles. And I get a call in uh, December of 19, the, the convictions came back in 85, in, um, 85 I'm sorry, 80, 85, in February of 85. And in uh, the winter, or in December, somewhere in late November or December, I get a call from somebody from the press in, in DeKalb County. They said, uh, you ever heard of a guy by the name of Brian Dugan? I said, yeah, I, I understand he's, you know, he's pled guilty to uh, killing two other women and raping a number of women and, 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 and raping the women he, he killed, too, as well. And they said, uh, well, we're hearing that he's also admitting to killing Janine Nicarico and that he did it alone. Well, I flip out. I say, you got to be kidding me. You, he's saying these things? They go, yeah. I said, what have you, and, 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 the, and the press, the, the reporter says to me, everybody in DuPage County says, you're the one spreading that rumor. I said, this is the first I've heard of it. Why would I spread something, something like that? And uh, 
Next thing I find out, I start making some phone calls. I call Judy Bracca, who was Brian Dugan's lawyer, and Tom McCulloch. I call Tom, who was Brian Dugan's lawyer, and they're playing it close to the vest. They're not telling me much. Tom says, call Ed Sazowski. Ed Sazowski is, the state, is, a, is uh, a guy from the state police who is investigating Brian Dugan. And I call him up, and he says to me, he plays it close to the vest as well. And it leads me to one of the second heroes of this case. Ed Sazowski starts investigating Brian Dugan, and he's got some pressure on him to work with DuPage County, because he's a cop, right? And the cops want to preserve these verdicts and keep going after Buckley and whatnot, and he's feeling that pressure. But he, he starts investigating, and he starts relating, hearing some of the facts that have occurred in this case. As he starts hearing those facts, he starts realizing well, Brian Dugan probably did commit this crime, and he's, as time goes on, he becomes more and more convinced. He tries to connect up Brian Dugan, who's seven, uh, approximately seven years older than Buckley, Hernandez, and Cruz. Uh, Dugan was 27 at the time of the crime. These guys were all roughly 20. That's a big seven years for that point in time. So he sends his, his agents out to the street, tries to connect them up, seeing if there was any kind of a connection, and there was no connection between Brian Dugan and the th uh, three original defendants. So he comes to the conclusion, and he tells, he tells everybody, he says, anybody who will listen, he says, Brian Dugan committed this crime. I'm sorry to, to uh, upset your apple cart, but he's your guy. Uh, at the same time, uh, the state's attorney's office in DuPage County is being harangued by the public defender who took over the case from me. And I, I'm saying to Carol Anfinson, who's the lawyer, I say, Carol, get these guys to send the shoe off to Bodziak if they can. So Carol starts bugging the prosecutors, and, the, and finally Bill Bodziak takes a look at the shoes, and he, t he gets the door, and he looks at it, and he says, you got the wrong guy. This guy's shoes did not make the print on that door. You've got the wrong guy. And so now they're, in the, they're, they're, they're trying to uh, prosecute Buckley, and, and the, the finest shoe print examiner in the country is saying, you got the wrong guy. Um, their shoe print examiner, the one with this crazy wear impression, uniqueness of wear impressions and shoe prints, she starts, she's, she's ill, she has cancer, and she's, she dies. After, after she dies, there's a, there's a group or there's a meeting of people on the West Coast trying to find out whether or not there's any, anything to substantiate her theories, and they come to the conclusion that her theories are, are baloney and that nobody should be able to make the kind of conclusions that she did. So the case falls apart. They dismiss the case against Steve Buckley. That leaves Cruz and Hernandez. And they, as Mr. Kamek told you, go through a couple more trials because the DuPage County State's Attorney's Office has insisted on continuing to prosecute these guys and not exonerate, publicly exonerate my client, Steve Buckley. One other thing is evolving in this case, as the case is evolving, and that's DNA. As DNA starts going, as DNA starts evolving, the defense lawyer starts saying, we want DNA testing done because there was semen found in Janine Nicarico's uh, anus. They found uh, um, semen. So they did DNA testing. And I tell, this, I tell this story. I said, you know, I call up Steve and I say, Steve, they're doing DNA. They want your, they want your uh, blood. At that time, today, they just swab your cheek. But back then, they need your blood. And I said, Steve, they want your blood for DNA testing. And his, basically, his response was, tell me where I have to go. Tell me what I have to do. And the same thing with Cruz, and the same thing with Hernandez. And the only guy who said, well, hold off on the DNA here for a minute, was Brian Dugan. Now, to his credit, Brian Dugan had been doing everything he could through Tom McCulloch, who I also consider to be one of the heroes in this case. To his credit, Brian Dugan said to McCulloch, and McCulloch said to Brian Dugan, we will do everything we can without exposing you to prosecution and the death penalty, but we're not going to make unprotected statements. So Tom, uh, with all his outstanding legal ability, had to make, I, I counted up 11 statements. All of them were protected. They couldn't use them against them. But in each of these statements, he was saying, I committed this crime. I committed it alone. And here are the details. And so they take these details. Now, as you can imagine, and one of the details Brian Dugan said was, I was smoking pot the day I took her. And the day I killed her, I was, I was high on pot. The first time he was asked about it by any police officers was, th was three years after the events had occurred. So he got a few details wrong, a couple details, but about 80, 90% of the details 
He got exactly right. The interior of the house, his description of the interior of the house was so good that Mrs. Nicarico said he sounded like an interior decorator. He talked about exactly how the crime occurred and how he hit her and how he killed her and what he was thinking at the time. And the state's attorney's office continued prosecuting Cruz and they continued prosecuting Hernandez. And these guys, my client, stayed in jail for three years. These guys stayed in jail and in prison for 10 years and, some, and seven of those years were on death row. DNA as, DNA, as the DNA advances and technology improves and the state's attorney's cases start to fall apart. And as that happens, all of a sudden we start sensing that Cruz's case is gonna be dismissed and he got a, he got a group of excellent lawyers who I, I, I know Rolando has had some gripes about some of his lawyers along the way, and I, I li actually liked them all, but his final group of lawyers, they were just superb. They were superb, and, and all, of, all of his lawyers are friends of mine to this day, but the final group of lawyers really put the pedal to the metal on his case, and they started finding out some things. One of the things they found out was they were able to debunk that vision statement by showing that uh, one of the guys who, who claimed to have received a phone call the night of May the um, uh, 9th, when the vision statement occurred, actually could not have received that phone call that night. And as a result of that, they, uh, the, the charges against Rolando Cruz were dismissed, or I'm sorry, it was in the middle of trial, uh, the judge directed a verdict of not guilty uh, and, and, and uh, Rolando was acquitted. Uh, about a month or two later, Alex Hernandez's case was, uh, he was acquit he was dis they dismissed the charges against him. So that brings us back up today. In Illinois, we don't have a death penalty. You know, and, I, and by the way, there's so much here. I've, I, I, if somebody were asked me, what percentage of this case have I summarized for you? I, I've, there's so much more of it um, that it, it would take, I would be able to talk here forever, and I think I've gone over my time as it is. Uh, but in any event, um, we don't have a death penalty today, and there are a string of cases that have caused that. But the first and the single most important case, that the first domino to topple in the state of Illinois, I think, and the biggest domino and the most important domino was this case, the Nicarico case. And that was, I think, the main case that caused then Governor George Ryan to call a hiatus to the death penalty. He didn't get rid of the death penalty. He just said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put, have anybody put to death while I'm the governor. And he called a hiatus and the, and the governor who succeeded him did so as well. And then subsequently, the state legislature has eliminated, eliminated the death penalty in Illinois. And I think you can thank the, uh, um, this case for that. Now, so it's not, there's bad news, obviously. Three innocent men were uh, in jail for long periods of time, and that's not what you want. Uh, but in the end, uh, we may have saved lives because the death penalty is a, such, a final, uh, such a final thing, and, I, and, and the, we are not perfect. Even prosecutors who act in good faith and do their best, and police who act in good faith and do their best make mistakes, and that's not the Nicarico case went way beyond that. The police and the prosecutors in that case, uh, uh, I, I think, acted, um, it was, like David said, malfeasance. And um, they, they hid evidence on us. They, they, they bounced evidence up uh, and brought it to trial at the last minute when our hands were tied, when we didn't have time, enough time to rebut it. It was a very difficult case and a very difficult time. And thankfully, uh, a number of people like Tom, who made sure that, because I, I don't know of another defense lawyer who would, make, who would, who would proffer up Brian Dugan for the, for the purpose of giving statement after statement after statement and shine the light on him. Uh, there was a, uh, obviously Ed Sazowski was vindicated because he caught, he caught some grief from the DeCarico family and the state's attorney's office in DuPage for coming down on the side of Brian Dugan committing this crime alone. Uh, John Sam's a hero, there's uh, uh, Rolando's appellate prosecutor, one of the prosecutors who was assigned to defend their death penalty verdict against Rolando Cruz, her name is Mary Bridget Kennedy. She, Ken, Kenny, she was prosecuting Rolando and she reads this thing over and she says, you know, I can't, I, she tells her boss, I can't do this, this guy's innocent. And it's pretty clear after reading the record, this guy's innocent, what, what are we doing? And uh, she resigns as a result, and they turn it over to somebody who would be willing to do it. But all these heroic people, and there were some journalists that obviously kept going at it, although the press started out at first kind of against us. By the end, the press was condemning this as, as and rightfully so, as the ugliest prosecution in the history of the state. Um, and um, that's all I have, so thank you.
Obviously, I think he left out a hero, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> now, I have heard this case talked about for a long time. What Gary didn't get a chance to mention was the investigation of the state police investigation. What he didn't talk to you about was his meeting with the FBI, where the FBI hero, they tied his hands. And they weren't talking to Mr. Johnson unless the state's attorney was present. And this FBI hero said to Mr. Johnson, don't say a word, I'll do the talk. Because once someone's been convicted and there's a question about whether or not the police acted properly or legally, mouths shut. People are told, yeah, you probably don't want to get involved with that. The fact that Mr. Johnson was able to get all these people involved is what gives him credit. Now, he talked about, a lot, about Mr. McCulloch and what Mr. McCulloch did. Let me tell you, this is one of the reasons I have the utmost respect for Mr. McCulloch. And let me tell you this story. You might remember a number of years ago, there was a Cook County public defender who, after his client died, was able to reveal that his client had confessed to a murder, and they freed a guy who had been on death row for 20 years. And everybody applauded him a hero. He wasn't a hero to me. Tom made sure that as soon as he saw that someone wrongfully convicted was there, did everything he could to help. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom McCullough. I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> you've heard it all. <laughs> all I can do is tell you from my little point of view. And, and I remember when this case started. Uh, my daughter was about 13. We live in St. Charles. You know, it was one of those things that Gary described. The horrible situation of the parents leaving the kid behind. Kid getting snatched and then ultimately being killed. And, and the age similarity was close enough to make me a little nervous. Um, my next contact that I remember with the case was a friend of mine named Mark Kowalczyk who represented the gas man because when the police in Naperville started out their investigation, one of the first suspects was a guy who came to check the meters. And of course, like everybody else who became the suspect, that got pretty vigorous. And, and Mark was a former prosecutor with me who was then in private practice in Glen Ellen defending the meter reader. And, and so I was aware of it. And the next thing I remember was uh, being with my daughter in downtown St. Charles, about a block from Gary's office. We were eating lunch, and Gary says, well, I want to show you something and, and see what you think of it. And that was the boot prints. <clears throat> and so we were invited over. Uh, we go up, and my daughter, with no exposure, looks at the two prints in Gary's office and says, well, these are different. <laughs> well, you know, it's easy to do that in an office, but, you know, you would think things would happen just as easily as that. And they just don't happen when, when prosecutors prosecute and people defend. <clears throat> My next uh, exposure was sort of through the back door. Um, in the public defender's office, we represent all sorts of people with all sorts of axes to grind or incentives to uh, do whatever. Um, one of whom I remember, known as El Panguino. El Panguino was a local burglar from Aurora, uh, the penguin. And uh, the penguin, <laughs> well, I know not, he was prolific. They probably had him on 50 residential burglaries. Residential burglaries back then and still now carry with it a mandatory minimum of four years for every one of them. 15 on the top end. And uh, El Panguino says, I have some information on that case over there in Naperville. So for his cooperation, and let me assure you, it was probably 100% bullshit. Uh, he walked away from all those cases. And, and he wasn't the only one. Um, we had people coming in, offering information, trying to seek a favor, get a deal. <coughs> so if you're looking for problems in the system, that's one of them. Uh, you know, rewards, other incentives other than monetary, what have you. Um, we came to represent Brian Dugan, and it was one of those tortured evolutions 
where Brian would get arrested on one day, we'd appear in court, public defender's office would get appointed, and he'd go back to the jail. And we'd say, Brian, don't talk to anybody. Well, they'd come and arrest him three days later, and they'd charge him with something different. And they would say, well, that's not a case you've been appointed to, so we can talk to him without dealing with you. Well, that nonsense goes on for a couple of weeks. And if you're ever called to answer a uh, trivia question, and you're asked, who arrested Brian Dugan and for what? I have the answer for you. He was arrested by the FBI, who don't do a lot of arrests out here, you must agree. And better yet, he was arrested for driving on a suspended license. Okay, so they were stacking their cases up. And uh, <laughs> you know, the, the time was, you know, and, and frankly, there were more sexual assaults than murders. And I suppose that's the way life should be. But uh, that's what we were facing as we moved forward. Now, unrelated to what we were dealing with was the uh, kidnapping and murder of Melissa Ackerman in LaSalle or DeKalb County. It became a LaSalle County prosecution. There was also an investigation into a woman in Geneva that had been snatched out of her car and drowned in a, uh, a local pond. Uh, Melissa had been killed in a pond as well. Uh, so as we were going on, we went through a couple of phases. And, and to be honest, uh, Brian Dugan, when we started, was sort of suicidal, or at least committing the legal version of suicide. He said, you know, I want a trial on everything. <clears throat> and so we were preparing it that way. Later on, he decided that he would like to live. And remember, we're facing two murders and six or seven sexual assaults. And uh, so our, our tactics sort of changed. Now, the, uh, he said, I would like to live. And, and if you can work out a deal that allows me to live, that's what I want to do. So out of that, we had conversations with the prosecutor in, in Ottawa and LaSalle County, uh, local prosecutors in Kane County, dealing with Donna Schnorr. And through that whole discussion, those two counties came to believe that it would be better, everybody would be better served if Dugan was given a life sentence. And it was frankly not anything that we cared about once you had your first life sentence. We were avoiding the death penalty. The 265 years we got for the sexual assaults were just gratuitous. And that sounds cold, but that's what they were looking for was the headline. So in those conversations, we, we learned that, uh, as Brian said it, guys are doing my time. You know, those Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley guys. And, you know, what did we know other than what I've told you? And I, I did know a little bit about Gary's experience in his first trial. But other than that, not much. And uh, so, like I said, LaSalle and uh, Kane came to an agreement. Brian pled guilty in Ottawa in the morning. He was driven up, pled guilty in, in Kane County in the afternoon. We were never able to come to an agreement with DuPage County. Uh, we told them, you got the wrong guy. We have the right guy. And, you know, you should let Cruz and Hernandez go. Uh, I'm not as good as Gary and certainly not as good as Rolando on, on dates. I sat there and, and he spiels out exact days <laughs> and exact number of years. And, you know, and my experience with people in the institutions are they know those dates. Yeah. Uh, I can only tell you that at the time I was doing some work for the Federal Defender Panel and it was my day. So I go downtown. Uh, do my work in the morning, take the train back, I get off the, the West Line in Wheaton, walk to the State Attorney's Office in, in DuPage County, and I am so totally convinced that I, I'm right and they're wrong. And this must have been 
probably in November, uh, that I can have this case done by Christmas. These guys should be out of jail, heading home for Christmas. So I meet with the elected state attorney, I meet with the first assistant, I explain to them, you got the wrong guy. Well, that took, what, 20 years wrong? <laughs> I was a little wrong. And uh, we had just, I go back, we put in, in Brian's pleas, and people who are pled and they're heading for the Department of Corrections are remanded to the county jail. They remain there for a couple of days, ready to go to the next place. Um, because of the amount of time involved, I had sort of neglected folks out in the jail, so I go out at night after dinner. I'm meeting with Brian, just kind of socializing, and we hear a voice saying, I'm here to see Brian Dugan. And I had this flashback from our way this case started. So I said to Brian, I said, well, what are we going to do now? We don't know who the voice is. Uh, I did have a private practice. I was a part-time public defender. Um, I said, Brian, if you pay me a dollar, I'll be your lawyer. That way you can say you got a lawyer. We won't have to go through this business of getting charged and, and uh, getting lawyers appointed. So that's what we did. Uh, that person was Ed Sazowski. He was there to follow up on the investigation from, from the state police side of things. And frankly, they were there looking to support the prosecution, but open to the idea that we had information. And by the way, we had a uh, uh, bargain basement sale. I uh, had an agreement with them that if we talked about any crime, they could verify anything. They could bring in police from any department. We'd talk to them. The only agreement was it was just so they could close their books. Um, so we had police from all over the northern third of Illinois trying to make their cases. As far as I know, there was only one case, and Brian was able to say with enough certainty uh, a date and a time and a place and some activity that they were able to track down a, a, an attempted abduction over in Downers Grove, I believe. So he was pretty good when he wasn't full of weed. Uh, so we, we provided information, and like Gary said, my goal was to keep Brian alive. So we phrased everything in terms of uh, plea-related discussions and hypotheticals. And those of you who are in the criminal justice field know that plea-related discussions generally are not admissible unless it results in a plea. So that's what we hung our hat on. And that's why we provided information to the uh, state police. And uh, I, that's where I learned more about the case than, than any other source. They would come and ask us about boots, and they would come and ask us about tree branches and a crowbar they were interested in and all that stuff. We tried to provide them enough information to verify it. And they would go off and, and they would interview people and do whatever they got to do. But at that time was when Gary was getting ready for his retrial. And I knew enough to know that we were providing them information known as Brady material. And that should be disclosed to the defense lawyer, not be Mr. Johnson. And so periodically I would ask Gary, what have you heard about <laughs> this? And, and he'd say, they haven't told me a thing. <laughs> well, I can't disclose it to him. I mean, that's not my job. I still got a client to represent. Um, but we went through all this business. So I knew he was getting sort of the short end of the stick in that deal. Uh, <coughs> such as it is. Now, the, the boot print reminds me, Gary is the authoritative source, other than Bill Bodziak, uh, about boots and how they're made and why they may look the way they do. So uh, if you ever want to know about Kenny shoes and Payless shoes and all that crap, he's your man. Uh, but what Brian had told the people was he'd kicked in the door. It was a stout door. It took him three kicks to get in. And... 
if it's hard to get the FBI to look at, at evidence after it's been viewed by other police agencies, imagine if a defendant or a defense lawyer is asking the FBI to get involved. And that's, that is impossible. Bozak wrote the book about uh, shoe prints and shoe print evidence. Literally, there is a book. Uh, and eventually, that door was transported to Washington. Bill Bozak was allowed to look at it. He said, well, I can detect, and granted the science has advanced a bit, uh, not only a boot print, but there's overlays. This door was kicked three times, which is exactly what Brian had told him years before, uh, which they poo-pooed. And, uh, and they always, from the day I met Ed Sazowski, he couldn't understand why um, in the description of the house, and, and Gary's right, uh, Mrs. Nicarico said the interior description was like an interior decorator. She, he did very well, but his description of the outside of the house missed a sailboat. A sailboat parked in the, in the driveway on the left-hand side of the house. Uh, well, how could you miss a sailboat if you were really there? To which my answer was, well, if you're a burglar, sailboat is not high on your list of things to take. <laughs> and besides, then you get in, you get busy, you get excited, you do all this other stuff, you leave. Um, but they always regarded the sailboat as a sign that he didn't know what he was talking about, that he was making something up. He was trying to disrupt the criminal justice system and that was sort of their attack. Uh, they found, well, Brian had said he threw the boots in a farmer's field. I forget, somewhere over on Jericho, who knows? Uh, <laughs> is that right, Roland? Uh, <laughs> he's read the reports. Um, and the only thing that was interesting was the farmer says, yeah, I remember plowing up boots. And they said, well, how long ago was it? And he said, Beans means corn. That was his cycle of crops. That's how he dated when he plowed up the boots. Well, the boots were thrown to the side and never were recovered. Like a lot of other weird little pieces of evidence that, that sort of went to the side. There was a time when uh, I looked up Ryan's picture in the Department of Corrections registry this afternoon. He's gotten old and gray, kind of like me. Uh, the, the view I had of him back in the day was long, bushy, wild hair. And, and they were bringing Brian to, to court appearances in DuPage County. And we couldn't figure out, well, why can't the guy get a haircut? What well, turned out, Sazowski wanted to get hair samples from him. So he told the prison, don't ever let him get a haircut till I tell you so. <laughs> so he came out looking kind of like a 60s hippie. And, and it fit the newsprint. Uh, there was a picture of him walking out of DuPage with this long flowing hair. Uh, the hair was intended, uh, what they found was a thing called pili bifurcatus. That's a single hair that grows out of one root, splits, and then rejoins again at the tip. It's very rare. And you, you find out about that by talking to people from the Red Kitten Labs. That's their business, they know hair. Uh, out of that discussion, uh, they exhumed the body of Janine Nicarico, only to find out that she had pili bifurcatus. So some of the things they were trying to investigate just didn't pan out. Uh, my recollections of Rolando were uh, of having to come to his court hearings in Wheaton a number of times, Rockford, Rock Island. Am I missing one? Okay, and my role was to proffer what would otherwise be hearsay. That was a, a big part of, of Rolando's appeal, was can you get the hearsay into his case? It was if Dugan was ever allowed to testify, it could have been used against him. My testimony was sort of structured to keep him off to the side and out of the prosecutor's limelight. 
but to offer evidence that could be used to evaluate the case against uh, Rolando and Alejandro. So <laughs> as the cases rolled on, I would appear, I would try to recall everything that Brian had said, and they would always say, well, didn't he have a deal? Well, not really. He had a deal that, that this stuff wouldn't be used unless and until he had a plea agreement, and, and they were not offering that. But he was making the proffer. Um, it wasn't a hypothetical thing. Those were real facts about real things, and, and they should be evaluated. And over time, the appellate court and Supreme Courts bought our argument, um, which I think helps. I don't know. Uh, but I would, I would come into court. By the way, I hate being a witness. Uh, I told you I don't know the dates very well. I would sit there and try to recollect the dates of my meetings with Sadowski and what was said. I remember one time walking into a hearing in Wheaton, and I'd spent all night long trying to memorize the damn dates. You know, it was like a test in college. And I walked in, and some defense lawyer had made this huge board, grease board, with dates written down. Those were the dates I had to remember. <laughs> well, and so they'd ask me something, I'd look at the board, and I'd say, well, on whatever, November 3rd. Um, and, and I would remember what was said, I just couldn't tell you the dates. Uh, so that's where that all ended. Uh, it ended successfully for Rolando and Alejandro and for Stephen. Uh, Brian was less successful. He, he accomplished his mission. Eventually, they did prosecute him. Um, he was tried and convicted in DuPage County, and at the conclusion of which they were aiming for the death penalty, but that was the time when the uh, penalty went away. So he's now serving three life sentences plus 264 years. So, um, that cover it? Tell about the time I went down to try to get him to testify. Oh, that's right. Well, Gary, Gary says, can I talk to your client? I said, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, this is uh, all sort of new territory. We're, we're sailing in uncharted waters. So Gary was, uh, I let him, made his uh, fervent pitch. And, Brian listened, I think he was polite. Uh, my recollection was thanks, but no thanks. Uh, but we did a lot of different things that, that really aren't in any manuals. Uh, Brian was interviewed on videotape under hypnosis in the Illinois Department of Corrections. That tape, uh, old VCR tape is what I recall, uh, was admitted into evidence on a Friday afternoon Judge ordered that court reporter to take custody of that thing, and by 10 o'clock at night, it was being played on Channel 5, is what I remember. Uh, how, how did that work? I think the court reporter had a relative that worked for Channel 5, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, that, you know, but it was, I, I got in an interesting position in the catbird seat watching prosecutors prosecute, and, defense lawyers defend and, and watch the work that, that Gary and Rolando's folks did. And, you know, you can't, uh, couldn't have asked for a better seat. Wasn't exactly the most comfortable thing I've ever done. Uh, Dave asked me to tell you about Jack McCullough, my uh, bastard uncle. <laughs> Name is not spelled the same. Uh, but it has some similarities because uh, in 1957, now Gary asked you where you were in, in the 80s. Uh, 57, I was in eighth grade. Um, Jack was a high school senior in Sycamore. Uh, he'd, uh, he lived in a particular neighborhood on the near west side where everybody supposedly knew everybody else. Uh, a girl named Maria Rydolf was kidnapped literally off the street uh, about 6 o'clock at night, 6.30. Uh, her body, body was not found immediately uh, because of the youth and being snatched. J. Edgar Hoover was then the head of the FBI. 
took a personal interest. He sent like 30 agents out to Sycamore. They uh, interviewed everybody else that was out there. And it's a small town. I don't know what it was like, probably 7,000 people back then, 5,000. But everyone knew everybody else. And by the next morning, everybody else was out searching the fields because it's primarily still to this day an agricultural community. <coughs> Nothing was ever found. Jack was interviewed. He said, I was in Chicago. I was applying for the uh, Air Force. Air Force or Army, because he was in both. But he'd gone down to the recruiting center in Chicago, taken, a, gone to, uh, to Rockford where his, Colonel Leibowitz was his recruiter. Uh, his office was in the post office. He delivered the paperwork. He'd been held over a night because there had been some questions about his medical condition. He gave the paperwork. He called home. This becomes important at 657. Called from a pay phone in the, what's the basement, or not basement, the lobby of the post office. It was a, in a time when you picked up the phone, you told the operator who you wanted to call, you wanted to make a collect call, she made a handwritten note. Uh, at 657, she dialed a number in Sycamore, Illinois, that listed to the McCullough House. Well, actually, at that time, he was known as Tessier. Tessier's accepted the call. Call lasted for two minutes. So at 657, a call is made from Rockford. Uh, the problem with the state's case was it had to, they had to advance their timeline to allow a kidnapping and a murder to occur and Jack to drive to Rockford. And uh, the case wasn't fully prosecuted. It was investigated. They abandoned it um, until I got out there in 2013 uh, when Jack's sort of crazy sisters came forward with a, a story about how their mother on their deathbed, on her deathbed, said, well, Jack did it. Uh, so they investigated, they got uh, pictures, a photographic spread of using high school graduation pictures, if you can imagine them in the 50s, all black and white. Five guys in, in suits and ties dressed up for your high school graduation. And you ask, why wasn't Jack's picture in the yearbook? Well, he'd been suspended. So his picture didn't appear there. They got a, a separate photo. He was the only guy in a regular pure white shirt with no tie and no coat. And the lighting was clearly different. And a witness who was then seven, 55 years later says, that's the guy. So. Um, that's what that case is about. And, and much like Rolando's case, there was evidence that was hidden, buried, misinvestigated, misinterpreted. Uh, but uh, more importantly, as unjust a conviction as that was, over time, the prosecutor in DeKalb County provided enough information. Now, this was not the one who prosecuted Jack. This was the next one, uh, who happened to live in the same neighborhood, knew many of the same people. Um, their children still live in that neighborhood. Um, did a thorough review, and uh, we call it the, the state prosecutor's burden, not only to seek a conviction, but really to seek justice. We provided him a bunch of this information about his alibi and his phone calls and all that. And the prosecutor filed a petition with the court saying, I agree that there's been an unjust conviction in, the, in our community. Jack was then brought before the court and eventually the case was dismissed. It, it is still going on. It's technically an open case. Uh, but he has filed a, the necessary paperwork to seek exoneration. Um, family members have sought release of some of these uh, discovery, the documents, the police reports. The uh, state police now say they have another suspect. Interestingly, a suspect came to their attention the day before a circuit judge in Cook County was to rule on why they didn't turn over all this stuff to the relatives. 
and they said, well, we've got a new suspect. We can't disclose a, an ongoing investigation, which sounds like nonsense, and maybe it'll be proven to be that way. But uh, Jack is out. He's living in uh, Washington, outside of Seattle, riding his bicycle every day. He survived four years uh, in the Department of Corrections. So How that was Oh, I have a statement from Rosette. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> You're referring to Dugan, right? It's on Jack, yeah. Well, um, well, there's a whole bunch of I mean, lie detectors come and go in our business. It, it is a uh, John Reed is the uh, former cop turned polygraph man. Him and Fred Inbaugh was a, a law professor at Northwestern. They cooked up this whole theory about how polygraphs can be done or should be done and, and it's uh, commonly believed to be designed to detect deception. Well that's nonsense. What it's designed to do is make you make statements. So um, where we run into them is defendants offer them a chance, you know, guys always think they can talk their way out of trouble. My experience is you talk yourself into trouble by talking to the cops, not out of it. So uh, there have been attempts at polygraphs, and usually when people pass them or they become inconclusive, people lose interest in them. Um, but they always draw, they're, they're like catching lightning in the bottle. And, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, it, it's still going on. Here's, here's yeah, what I want. I, I am unintentionally putting Tom in a bad position because that, there are still ongoing cases and there are parts about this that he may be a witness and so I don't yeah. want you to cross any line. But if you can well, still be... Here's, here's the, on a closely related point, um, and I guess if there's police here, I apologize. Um, Jack was arrested in, in Washington based on an arrest warrant that the affidavit that supported it was about four pages and if you reduced the truth of that affidavit there was maybe three or four sentences and the rest was sort of conjecture and speculation all by the bottom approved by Clay Campbell the elected state's attorney. Jack was detained and questioned um, there was discussion about polygraphs. Um, there was a uh, recitation in court that, that contained two significant parts. One, this wasn't recorded. And B, the defendant said, uh, what a lovely, lovely girl the deceased was. And that's sort of all they presented in the trial. And, and there wasn't any discussion about polygraphs. What's significant is that after Jack had gone to prison, um, through some blunder, and I think it had to do with, with Jack's stepson, he foia the Seattle Police Department, found a YouTube video of his uncle, um, and, and the woman who was doing the interview mischaracterized her role in this thing. She described herself as being a social worker for the police department or something to that effect. When she testified, she was a sergeant of the Seattle Police Department. And there was this whole damn video that she swore didn't exist. So that's part of the, the post-trial things that are going on. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. As I said, another one of my heroes, and, and who'd have thought Tom got involved in that Nicarico case, and then next thing you know, 25 years later, here he is in another case involving police misconduct and prosecutorial misconduct, which he didn't talk about. I can share just what I read from the newspapers, is that the prosecutor was aware of that recording, and might be let the evidence come in a little too loosely, if you will. The prosecutor has an obligation to not bring forth anybody who's lying, and if it does happen, to call the court's attention to it. We'll see what happens. We've talked a lot about Rolando. He's been kind enough to be here with us. 
as I said at the beginning, it's hard for Rolando. He's got his lovely daughter here with him. Ladies and gentlemen, Rolando Cruz. To follow Gary Johnson <laughs> and Tom McCullough, it's like really strange. Um, I'm gonna try to condense two different parts of my life that happened. One, which Gary got the numbers wrong, was 12 years, three months, three days, one and a half hours <laughs> that I spent on death row, locked up total. Almost 10 of it was on death row. The last 21 years, three months, and 18 days that I've been out, I'm gonna try to explain the things. Gary was so much of an attorney, so good, that that was the spark that I had in believing when it first got indicted. In 83, I was gonna be 20 years old, and they came to Aurora, and the east side of Aurora back then we hung around and we didn't get along with the police. We didn't trust the police and they didn't trust us and that's the way it was. They lied to us, we lied to them. None of us knew about the Nicarico case and it was no more real than a Freddy Cougar movie to us and I hate saying that but that's just the truth. We were a bunch of smart ass street punks that lied to the cops. We hated each other, most of us, because we grew up from different sections, different schools, whatever. And when Hernandez started lying, he was in the opposition gang, opposition neighborhood, whatever. So it was easy for people to lie about each other. And nobody, a lot of us were not friends. A lot of us did not hang around. There was, I believe, 200 some people that went in front of the grand jury. And Stephen Buckley was not my friend or someone I grew up with. I knew who he was because the world was smaller back then just as Hernandez, but we were not friends. We didn't associate together. Um, my name came up because Alejandro had mentioned an individual by the name of Arthur Lee Burrell. And Arthur Lee Burrell used to steal, he was a burglar, and I used to buy stuff from my East Defense, and I was selling the stuff, and that's how my name came up. And um, so, when they started lying, we all lied. All of us. We were, we were. <laughs> we, we were confused. We lied. But, but, we all knew partial truth was that we didn't commit this crime. And no matter what they did to us, we didn't have to talk to each other about testifying against one another or anything like that. And DuPage made sure they kept us secluded for quite a while, especially from each other, the whole duration. And we never plotted or made plans and you know, not to speak about each other once we got locked up. And actually when we did get indicted on March 9th, 1984, I remember they came at 6.30 in the morning and they told me that someone was there to visit me. Sergeant Cantwell from DuPage County told me. And he told me that when I went in that room, if they did anything, just to pound on the door and he'd get me out. And Tom Knight, Pat King, and all these detectives were in this small little room. And they started telling me it was my last chance and I had to turn around and testify against Stephen Buckley and Hernandez. And they kept on and, and I told them that I don't know what they're talking about. They knew we were lying, they, you know, just like they were lying to us. And, it, you know, we, we were very immature for our age. We should have been more mature, but we weren't. And I apologize for that. <sighs> they told me that they were gonna read me my rights, and they were gonna charge me on a 12 count indictment, three counts of murder, et cetera. 
And I told him, whatever. And they read my rights. I told them I didn't understand my rights when they asked me. So they had a Latin cop tell me in Spanish, and I told them I still didn't understand it. And they said, okay, well, you need to be a smart ass, whatever. We're going home to eat breakfast. And I said, whatever. I mean, because it wasn't real to me. It's not real that they're going to indict you for a murder you never committed. And when I hear people tell me, well, that will never happen to me, you know, I'll never put my, I know a lot of death penalty cases where people don't put themselves in that position at all. It has nothing to do with gangs, nothing to do with anything, it's just they don't put yourself in that position. And they get indicted anyway. And um, we walked in that courtroom that morning. I asked the bailiff, who are those two individuals standing there? He says, they're your co-defendants, that's Hernandez and Buckley. I said, what the hell is a co-defendant? I didn't even know what it was. And then he told me, the guys you committed the murder with. I said, like, what? What the hell are you talking about? Like, the reality of really being charged with this was not. It wasn't sinking in. And we started going to trial, and it was like not really happening. And then. Mr. Johnson appears, and my, as most people that get locked up, didn't really, I didn't have a lot of faith or respect for a lot of public defenders because of what everybody was telling me. I had never been locked up before. And I'm listening to all this, and it's like, and then I see this guy, and he's like coming out shining, and he's like doing everything, and my mother fell in love with him. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> And it just, it just felt good, you know? There's somebody that's actually trying, and, and I mean, the other ones were trying, but I didn't see it that way. I was very biased against what was going on with my life. And um, on February 4th, Friday, we were gonna start trial on Monday the 7th. They came and they handed over a statement the dream vision statement, they said it was two sentences long. When they got done testifying, it was hours and hours and hours long. And it was all lies. And we never knew where it came from. They never, they, they had nothing as Mr. Johnson said. And I could never figure out why and how could this happen, you know? I gotta go home. You know, they're, they're lying, you know? And we got convicted. And I remember I told my mother, I told my mother I'd let them. I'd let them execute me before I ever say I did something I didn't do. As John Sam said, we were just three months. We weren't these big, tough mafiosos, and they couldn't break us to, do, to testify against each other. And that's all we were. But I wasn't going to turn around and s testify against them guys. And Pat King and Tom Knight offered me that the night before. They, I got sentenced to death. They said that if I would test, they saw the way I looked at Stephen Buckley in that courtroom and they knew that I wanted him and they wanted me to testify against him that if I would, they would beg this, the judge to give me natural life without parole. And I told my mother that night, there's no way. I said, I wasn't there. I don't know who did anything. I said, they're just going to have to kill me. I got sentenced to death plus 300 something years each time. I went to death row and I had the honor of meeting a very, very great man who recently passed away named Dickie Gaines. He was on death row himself. And he started teaching me the law and started getting me to understand what was going on with me. And he asked me, what my date of execution was, and I told him I didn't have one. And he says, you do, everybody has one. I said, what the hell are you talking about? No, I don't, I was in the courtroom, you weren't in the courtroom. I know what the hell's going on. He goes, look at your minimus. I said, what the hell's a minimus? So he tells me, and I'm looking, and I froze. Because I seen 
my warrant of execution for the first time ever. My life changed. I knew at that minute it was either give up or go forward at any cost necessary. So I started learning from Mr. Gaines and I would argue and debate with these lawyers and <laughs> just trying to figure out what was going on and trying to learn. And then uh, we went and we got the appeal and we went on the severance issue. And uh, got a couple lawyers there that turned around and got together and represented me on my second trial. And I remember at halfway through the trial, I knew that I was going to go back. But I knew I was going to go home. I knew I was going to stay there, but I knew I had to go back to death row. And when John D. Ray, who was my investigator, came in and he told the attorney I had at that time that Nike was, because DuPage County changed his strategy. And now they were saying that there was three footprints, Buckley's were on the door, well now it was Dugan's. Dugan's were on the door now because they conveniently switched defendants. Hernandez had one footprint by the window, they now said, and the other one, obviously, had to be his. The problem with that was that shoe could literally, the whole shoe could go inside my shoe. So it was impossible for me to ever wear that shoe. And Nike was willing to come in to testify to that. But the attorney I had at the time, with all due respect, decided that he had did a good enough job and he didn't really need that. So that was never introduced. And it probably wouldn't have mattered anyway because of the way the trial was going. And um, I remember when they read the verdict of guilty, I looked back and I seen Muriel Clare from WGN News crying and shaking her head no. And that meant a lot, and I'll explain why after a while, but um, during that trial, I was learning a lot more things and I had heard about DNA and about Mr. Dugan, of course. And it was weird because here they gave him a liar detector test and they would never give us one, even though we asked. They wouldn't even give us a hypnosis, but he received one. It, it, it wasn't making sense what was going on. I'm still trying to figure out what's all going on. So when I get back to Menard Correctional Center's death row, I was explaining to Mr. Gaines what had happened, and he was like, wait a minute. He goes, demand DNA test. So I had Tim Gabrielson and John Hanlon from the Illinois State Appellate Defender's Office, criminal division, uh, uh, capital case division representing me, and they said they weren't gonna be able to do it again. And I told them they have to. Otherwise, I'd repeat it myself. <laughs> and that I wanted the DNA. And nobody under, they, they were like, what? And I said, well, I want this. I heard about this. I want it. And Tim said, one or two things are going to happen. Either one, it's going to prove that you're the greatest liar and you convinced us that you're innocent and you're really guilty, or it's going to prove that you are innocent. I said, take it. Take all the blood you need, just leave me enough so I can live. And um, we fought DuPage County to get the test done. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to pay for it. And the lawyers did everything they could do. Eventually, once it was, they, it was ordered it was going to be done, then they decided they would do it. They thought they were going to get credit. Um, but in the meantime, while that was going on, Tim and John myself and Mr. Gaines put together a list of lawyers. And we started going through this list. And contrary to what some people think, lawyers did not come out the woodwork to help. Nobody came out to help me personally, nobody. 
and we went after them and um, Susan Valentine, who was one of my lawyers, helped out a lot in convincing Larry Marshall, the professor from Northwestern, who's now at Stanford University, to come out and speak to me and to review the case. And um, Larry obliged her in time and got involved, thank God for him, um, a great man. And um, they also got in touch with Nan Nolan, who worked with Susan Valentine at uh, Robinson, Curley, and Clayton at the time. And she got involved and they talked to Tom Breen and to Matt Kennelly and they came down and we spoke and we interviewed and it was weird because I didn't really know what to say. It was like little goofy things that I said that their response made a big difference. And when I went through with Mr. Gaines and explained to him what was going on, he said, yeah, go with this one, go with that one, see what they say. And at the time, the defense team was put together. And while it was being put together, Mr. Marshall and uh, a couple other lawyers were putting together the appeal for the second trial. Marlene Kamish, who was one of my attorneys at the time, and Ricardo and John Hanlon came to death row the day the appeal was going to be in town. We were in the visiting room and we're waiting, waiting for the Supreme Court to hand down a decision. Then Chief Just Justice Hypo had said, due to the overwhelming physical evidence, he had a, no choice but to uphold the conviction against me. Problem with that was there was never any physical evidence. And I remember John went to check and he went outside and he called Tim and he came back in and he looked at me and says, he just, he didn't know what to say, but I already knew, we knew. And they sat down and I think at that point is when I realized what was really happening with my life. And they started crying and even though I'm crying now, at that time I didn't cry. I just looked at him, I said, why are you crying? We know what we have to do. We know we're standing on thin ice. Okay, I gotta go, I gotta go back to the cell. And I got up and I walked out the visiting room. At that point I knew that it wasn't about me. It wasn't about Hernandez, it wasn't about Buckley. It was about fighting and stayed strong and making a change and demanding what we have coming to us. And I talked more to Tom, who I look up to as a father figure, and Nan, and we would talk more and more, and Larry Marshall would come down and we would argue and get mad at each other because our points of law were different, but we were all still doing the same thing. And eventually, Larry got a group of people to file different amicus briefs on an our behalf, as you remember. And um, the Illinois Supreme Court decided, and I believe it was the first time for a death row inmate to have his case reheard. And Justice Ann McMorrow at the time asked the state's attorney if there was ever any physical evidence against me, as Justice Heupel had said there was. And the state's attorney admitted that there wasn't, that there was none. So they granted me my third trial. The third trial was really strange because it happened so fast, but yet it had probably the strongest impact of all the trials. And not because it was my trial, but because of the defense team, the way they united, the way they affected other people. When I say the defense team, I don't mean only those that represent me, but also Mr. Johnson's defense team that he had together and everybody, all the former ones, they, they stuck together, they stuck to their guns and they, they got people, they networked and they did what they had to do. And 
I remember when things were going on right before Detective Manasano was going to testify, the attorneys asked for a sidebar, and we went to the judge's chamber, and they told the judge that the state was going to be put on Detective Manasano, and he was lying about the vision dream statement, and that they had proof, airplane ticks, et cetera, that he was in the state of Florida at the time. And the judge asked the state's attorney, Kinsella, what did he have to say about it? And he, like a little kid, kicked an invisible pop can and said, well, they can put him on the stand and impeach him. And so he got on the stand and he was impeached. And uh, right away, Matthew Kennelly stood up and said he wanted a, a directed verdict of not guilty. They were filing the motion and that they would write it up and they wanted the judge to take consideration. The judge took a recess so that they could do it. And I was leaving the courtroom and the bailiff who had always been there, it's always been the same man, he was there all the way from the beginning. And he stopped me and he says, hey Rolando, You remember a long time ago, you asked me if I thought you were guilty? I said, no. I said, I probably did though. He goes, hey, there's a lot of us that work here that are, have a Christian group, and we pray for you guys. Here, and he gave me a little pocket Bible. And he goes, you're gonna go home. And I went down to the cell, to the pod they had me in at DuPage, and I was walking around and all the guys are like, what's going on? I said, I don't know. And I called my cousin, Hector, to tell him. And he says, well, just go back in there and plead guilty so you can come home. I'm like, wow, really? It's like, <laughs> like wait a minute, you know, I've been, you know, it's, it's been 12 years, three months, three days, one and a half hours, and you're telling me just to go plead guilty to something I didn't do? You know, like, what the heck, you know, are you crazy? And so I hang up on him and I'm so mad, I don't know what's going on now. I'm like, wait a minute, I've been fighting. I'm not, you know, I didn't do anything. No, it just didn't happen. So I come out, and then the bailiff tells me, he says, okay, these other guys are going to take you in the courtroom now. He goes, but don't be scared. Just don't be scared. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Now, everything starts spinning, and this, the biggest bailiff I've ever seen in my life comes up, puts a double waist chain on me, lock handcuffs, 50,000 volts of electricity around me, and shackles, and tells me, one wrong move, and he has a trigger. We get to the courtroom. He says, you're gonna see something there. Don't be scared, it's for your protection. I'm thinking, what? what are you talking about? And I walk in, they have this bulletproof partition right behind the attorneys, separating the people. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, what's going on? So I, I tell Nan, you know, I got to talk to you, I got to talk to you. So finally, she goes, what's going on? And I told her, she goes, maybe you misunderstood. I said, no, this is what the bailiff told me. I'm going home, why is this on here? So she goes, well, let me get Larry, and let me get Tom. So she talks to them. Well, at the time, I didn't know until maybe a year later, two years later, Tom went and asked the bailiff. And the bailiff told him, yeah, that I was gonna go home. Well, when the judge came out, he seen the partition, and they had all sorts of officers in the courtroom. They never had that before. They only had this one old man, bailiff. All of a sudden they need all these cops and this bulletproof thing and the other chains, whatever. So the judge comes out and he sees it and he says, Lux, he says, no. He says, get all this out of my courtroom and get it out now. And he walked off the bench. He was upset. He came back in. Everything was back to normal except for that one big bailiff, the waist chains, and the electric belt. I sat down where Mr. Johnson is. Mr. Breen sat where Mr. McCullough's at. And Tom told me, it's okay, it's okay. And I can pray, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And I'm shaking my leg. And Tom grabbed my leg. So the other one's just shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the judge came out. And he says, sits down picks up a picture of Janina Carrico, and he said, this case is not about 
Rolando Cruz. This case is not about anyone else but Janine Nicarico. I don't know what else he said because at some point in time, it happened so fast that even Tom, who was holding my leg with his left hand, didn't even feel it. The bailiff just grabbed me and snatched me out of the courtroom. I had to read the transcript later to know what happened. And I was in the hallway and the bailiff told me, well, you, you happy, you gonna cry, you pissed off, what? And I was like, I was shocked. I didn't, I didn't even know what the hell was going on. So they take me to change and tell me that I'm going home. I said, well, I'm not changing then. I'm not gonna change, what am I gonna change for? And then Sergeant Lavery, who I remember when he first started at DuPage County Jail, he comes out, he goes, no, leave him alone, leave him alone. I got all his property, I got him, he's going home. He goes, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you know, he, he got me out, he got me out. It was so fast and so unexpected that everybody was waiting for me to come out. They snuck me out of the side over there, nobody knew it, everybody's at the courthouse waiting for me to walk out. That my mother just happened to be there by accident because she got lost, she didn't know how to get back. <laughs> so she was standing right there, so and got out. But um, that was the first portion of the 12 years, three months, three days, one half hours of my life being locked up. Since then, I have been very honored to be able to speak to people. And because Mr. Gaines enlightened me so much and taught me so much, I have been given my baby and my kids. And I love my kids. And we do what we have to do. And I realized that what happened to me is not a bad thing. It was a great thing because I was able to withstand it. I do suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome and sometimes have bouts of depression. I yell a little bit too much. <laughs> but I know it happened to me for a reason. It's helped a lot of people. I know a lot of people that have been freed from death row because of what happened to me. I know a lot of people that have changed their lives because of what happened. So therefore, I think it's a great thing that happened to me. I don't see it as a bad thing. I don't even see it as a sad thing. I really don't. I'm extremely grateful for the individuals that have all given time to help make this possible, that I can go home every day to my babies. And I really encourage people to get in law enforcement as prosecutors, righteous, honest prosecutors. Thank you. We have time for some questions, but before we do, <laughs> I was watching you guys. When he teared up, a whole bunch of you teared up. <laughs> and that means you're paying attention, A, and B, you realize that these questions of justice we talk about have consequences. And fortunately, we have a strong man like Rolanda who can share it thanks to these heroes here. Now, uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. I mentioned this before. Um, I've been teaching university for 15 years. I know what 19-year-old boys are like, Mr. Cruz, and you pretty much describe the average 19-year-old boy who lies to each other, <laughs> really, you know? And I think about if I was judged, or any of us were judged, by what we were like at 19. You know, uh, God help me, I'd be in prison. <laughs> I feel I think I would. Um, but another thing I did want to say is I did touch your, and she is beautiful. Your daughter, my gosh. I did talk to her. 
And I, I really agree. You really are a hero because I was here at that time. I remember that picture of that poor little girl. I remember seeing you being interviewed and saying, how did that sweet boy to me, it, he, you, you're so, you were so soft-spoken and, you know, at, uh, it was a little kinky, but anyway. Um, yeah, and, and I said, and I told your daughter that because of her father, you saved 19 lives, at least. Uh, uh, the other uh, uh, people off death row are now in life, you know, so they still have a chance. So it's going to be more, but we're talking about, if you were in the military, you would have a Medal of Valor or a Silver Star right now. And I think that that's something to be very proud of. I thank you. Any other questions for any of the panelists? Yes, sir. Um, Keep your voice up. Yeah. <laughs> um, have any like major legal precedents come out of this case? I'll let Gary answer, but the answer is a bunch. <laughs> um, two, two good ones. Well, three. Uh, it's it's so it's not so much a legal precedent, but it really put it like uh, uh, um, magnifying glass here. On the uh, death penalty, so in a way, that's a precedent. There were two more technical uh, precedents. One of them was uh, uh, whether somebody, a prosecutor, can put somebody on. This is one of the reasons for one of your reversals. Whether a prosecutor can put somebody on the witness stand, knowing they're not going to, uh, knowing they're going to say A, just to impeach them with a prior inconsistent statement, which is B. And the problem is. They used that B to convict uh, on the second conviction, Rolando Cruz, and the Supreme Court said no. And that case is cited all the time for when anybody puts, prosecution or defense puts a witness on the stand for the purpose of simply getting, simply getting in a prior inconsistent statement. Uh, the second one, uh, there, well, there's actually three. The second one was dealt with severance. It's uh, the, three, the three cases that were tried together should have been tried separately. That was a no-brainer. Actually, I don't know how much law that made. That was so easy, and they were just stupid to try them together. Um, but they did. And then the third one was, um, we, everybody was, when I went down to visit uh, with Tom, when I went down to visit uh, Brian Dugan, I wanted to him to come in and testify because the judge had earlier said his hearsay statements, in other words, the tape-recorded hypnosis statement or any other hearsay statements, were not going to come into evidence. Either he testified personally or, or there was no Brian Dugan. Uh, the hearsay statements could not come in. And over time, that, uh, they made some law with regard to when, or they refined the law as to when hearsay statements under those circumstances can, in fact, come in. So those were the three major things, I think. Question? Yes, ma'am. For whom? Oh, uh, for um, Mr. Uh, Cruz. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, I, I mean, I know that this has, that the whole ordeal was, you know, more than traumatic or, or, you know, hard for you to get through, especially, you know, with the outcome that you had. Do you think that it was a, um, my son, I brought my son here so that he can, you know, hear and, and try and get a little bit of understanding and how things can work, you know, in different ways. Uh, sometimes they don't go the ways, you know, that we want them to go. But do you think that this was somewhat of a case of maybe wrong place, wrong time, as far as when it first started? Or do you think that you were, Profile. No, I, I, uh, I've got people upset with me because I don't think this was a racial case at all, at all. It, it was more social class. It was in, in that sense. But um, we, we didn't, they didn't come at us personally. Okay. 
They just went to Aurora because Aurora was a lower income area than Naperville. We, and, and, and I take responsibility, I don't know how many other people take responsibility, we should have had been more mature at, everybody was from 16 to 21. And we should have been more mature and not lied to them and should have took it serious. It wasn't a wrong place, wrong time situation at all because we were not at that place at any point in time in our entire lives. So it had nothing to do with that. It, it was the cops coming and talking to a bunch of smart Alex street punks. And, and we, didn't, we had no need to respect them. They didn't respect us. They didn't respect our families. Why would we respect them? I mean, that's what it was about. It wasn't about a poor child that had some horrific things happened to her, and including her life being taken. You know, none of that was real to us, and, and, and I, to this day, feel extremely bad, you know? So, no, I, I don't think that at all. And, you know, and I was gonna say, just so you guys know, I, I feel a lot for the care goals. And I have raised my kids, through the three youngs I've raised for over eight years by myself. And Samira Murillo, since she was five, has helped me raise Kazoo and Harley because I had to work. And she has always been there. And I have always worried, and I still worry, that something like that could occur. And I am very protective. I am a mother and with my kids because I know it could happen. So, um, like I say, it, it's not a wrong place, wrong time. It wasn't a profiling. They, unless you want to say they profiled the whole city of Aurora because they went to the city for They didn't go specifically to the Latino community or the African American community or the white community, because it was a mixed thing. There was, you know, Latins, there was blacks, there was whites, there was everything in it. You know, it was just a bunch of smart outs that were being smart outs. You know, so, you know, but, you know the good thing is that a lot of positive came out of it. So what would you say now to the teenagers or the, the guys that were, that are your, well, that, are in that age range now that are dealing with or are engaging with police officers and have that, you know, sort of, you know, I don't respect you, you know, versus everything that's going on in the media as far as police and, and community efforts are going, but what would you say to them? Like, would you say, you know, to just generally have respect for police or if, even if they have preconceived notions like, you know, we hate the police or everybody we know hate the police. You know, what would you say to them as far as you going through your situation and knowing what you could have done or the way you could have acted when you were first, you know? Well, I, I raised my kids that, my kids know how I feel towards police officers. And, but I, you know, we respect, we respect everybody. And, you know, we, we everybody's special. Everybody's special in their own way. You gotta respect everybody. You don't like somebody, you stay away from them. Just stay away, you know, we, we stay away. We move way out here, away from everybody. We moved to Wisconsin away from everybody. Mr. Johnson, you know this. We, we moved away to stay away from people. And not everybody could do that. We couldn't, it's not that we were rich, we could do it, but we, we struggled too. And, but we moved away. And our thing is, and I still have my kids, is to respect. You may not like somebody, you stand up for you believe them, but you respect them, you leave it alone. You know when to walk away, don't say nothing. You, they, they come home, they start talking crazy, just leave them alone, walk away. You come, you tell me I'm your parent, I'll take care of you. You know, and it's hard. It's harder to be done than said, and I know that. I worked with Jane Ann's Law Association with, 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 as a youth advocate for three years, and I know it's very hard. But you have to, I mean, because reality <coughs> is any of us can end up on death row where I was at, just because you rub the wrong person the wrong way. And you can't do that. You, you just have to respect yourself first. Know yourself, respect yourself, and leave everybody alone. You know, just do your thing and stay positive, no matter what. Because under all of that, I've stayed positive. Question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if it's too personal, you don't have to answer. But you said you finally saw the date of when you were supposed to be executed. No. Can you share with us what date that is? <laughs> is it like past the time of now? 
It, well, my, my original day of execution was March 12, 1985. And I was, when I got it, I sat down. I just kind of like plumped down on the plump right there and just like grabbed an ink pen and just there. Because there's, when you get your writ of, your, 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 your warrant of execution, then you have a writ also. And it says, we the people of the state of Illinois hereby on this day will execute. And it was like three and a half hours. I didn't know what a stay was or an appeal. I had no idea of none of that. So to me, I was given to be executed in less than three and a half hours. I had no idea about anything. So it just that time changed. That's when I realized there's no straddling offense in life in anything. If you don't move forward and you think by standing still that you're you know, you go, well, I'm going to be right here, I'm going to let it go. No, then you're wasting, you're, you're going negative, you're going backwards. So either you go forward or you go backwards, there's no in between. And that's just my personal perspective. You have to go forward, you cannot go backwards. Going backwards is not, does you no good, does you no good. You have to go forward. And then that day I realized, I started realizing a lot of things that I did, how wrong it was. And I, I really felt bad, and I said, I still do. Question? Yes, sir. Um, over the years, have you had any contact with uh, the Nicaragua? The Caracos? Yes, the family, and then also, um, over the years, have you had any contact with Dugan? I, I never knew that the Caracos nor Brian Dugan, so there, there was never any need for me to be in contact with them. I seen the Caracos one time during the trial of the DuPage 7, they were standing out, well inside the courtroom but on the lobby, and I walked up and I see them standing there, and I said hi, and they smiled and said hi, and walked mind my business, I mean there's, you know, no no need, I mean, for me to say, I did, you know, I, I don't see a need to speak to them, not to be rude or disrespectful, I think DuPage County, the original prosecutors, have a lot of uh, apologies that they need to ask for, within the characters for lying so much. But I, I don't, um, I, I see no need for me to have a you know, general conversation with anything. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, I can tell you guys the words. So specific with that language and the word malfeasance, whereas of course I would use the word criminal. <laughs> well, they were prosecuted. Yeah, well, and as Mr. Cruz mentioned, the DPH 7, um, I don't think you talked about that. Wait. I, I did a little bit. I said they were charged and uh, acquitted. Acquitted. Mr. Johnson was a witness. Four, uh, yeah, I had to test it. It's right. It's no fun being a witness. There were four uh, police officers and three prosecutors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that. Question? <laughs> well, you, you know why. So I do. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about Mr. Gaines and how he helped you. Do you think there is a need for legal education within the criminal, well, within prisons or jails for um, inmates? Mr. Gaines recently, he, well, through the years, he put together a major lawsuit against Detective John Burge in Chicago. And Mr. Gaines was the entire backbone of that entire case. Other lawyers came up front and took it because they were lawyers. And for Nason Fields, and they just won $22 million or something like that on this case in Chicago just recently, like a month ago, I think. And Mr. Gaines um, was back on for it. He, he taught a lot of people the law. He was self-taught. 
And um, I, I think there is a need because a lot of individuals cannot afford. And, and I understand, which I didn't understand in the beginning, which everybody has to understand that. And, and Mr. Johnson barely touched on it. I, I, there was lawyers, and it was now I don't, but at the time, earlier time I released, that I did not like a lot of the lawyers that I had, and I did not respect them that were public defenders. But I did not understand at that time that they are so overworked. They, their caseload is so crazy, so underfunded. And you know, when you're inside, you're not looking at that or thinking of that. So you get really biased against people that are actually really trying. And then I get offended when people tell me, well, I'm not a lawyer, I don't want a public defender. The public defenders are lawyers. That's just the name of their law firm. <laughs> you know, and they say, oh, no, no, you're right. No, you don't know what you're talking about, so you're not even talking to one. Because they, <laughs> they are lawyers. And they are the most stressed out lawyers because their caseload is overwhelming. And, and I understand it. And it took me years to understand it. I didn't understand it. And, and I was very I was very hurt by it. And, and I learned in time. And I learned in time about that. And I thank Mr. Gaines for that because he did teach me that. And just, you know, he did just recently pass away of cancer. But, you know, I, I thank God for him. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so do you think that there's any way, or do you have any sort of idea of how to get the community better in relations with the police in Aurora or any other county that has issues with people telling the truth to police or always running into problems? Well, it, I think when it's done with the police, I think they should be rotated, not just stay on the streets or just behind the desk. I think, because they can burn out just like anybody else in any job, anywhere in a factory, they can and they rotate. So you don't get burned out. And you get burnt out easy as a police officer when you're dealing with criminals every day that are lying to you. And, and you get tired of it, you get sick and tired of it, and, and you need to be rotated. Uh, but the community in turn, I think the problem is that if you try to discipline your child, everybody says, well, you gotta call child abuse. You know, that, that's ridiculous, that's what the problem is. When I grew up, it was totally different. And, I mean, we didn't have the problems in school because we knew what they said was going to be happening. That was it. You got swatted, you were bad, you got it. But the problems in school were almost nil compared to now. Because now you can't say anything, teachers can't do anything, kids can do whatever they want, and that, that's ridiculous. So, they, it, and it starts at home. It starts at home, and I believe that it takes a community to raise a child <laughs> instead of these kids imprisoning a community. Or me, I'll go. You know, you know, in my house, we go to the school year party every year, and my kids, all their friends come over. And I want the community to see this. I want them to see it. To see that I'm doing this. You guys can do it. Reach out. And then the cops, there's cops that play on my daughters. Their kids play on my daughter's team on soccer. And we talk. And you have to. You have to talk. Without communication, it's not what misunderstanding. <laughs> Rondo, I want you to know when you were talking about how it starts at home, the two juvenile police officers who were here both nod. I'm not, I'm not going to point to them, but they both nod. It starts at home. We have another question? Oh, my word. All right, two more. I'd like to ask, what are your, your goals to do with your life now? My plans, my goals to do my life. Watch my kids. Go to college. And uh, watch them graduate college and see them go on their lives. That's what they're just like. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask once um, you were released, and uh, was it in terms of work and community acceptance? And I mean, how was that? How difficult was that? And how did you go about doing that? And I'm sure it was very difficult. <coughs> No. <laughs> My life's not normal. I didn't have a difficult time. I, I came out November 3rd, 1995, and we were all together that night, and the morning, Tom, Mr. Green, me and him went to go get um, 
McDonald's. <laughs> um, we went to a gas station to get him a pack of cigarettes, and, and we went in, and everybody in the gas station just looks at that's him. And I was like, oh, oh. And the newspapers came out, and everybody started asking for autographs. And I, I never had anything negative. Nobody's negative ever. I've been blessed with that. Nobody negative has come up to me. Um, I've traveled quite a bit speaking in other countries in Europe. I, I didn't work for quite a few years. I volunteered in communities because I was always speaking. I never had anything. But I, I think the defense team that I had because they're the ones that made sure I had clothes and places to sleep. And, you know, they, so I, I, I've been very blessed. Before I let you go, there's one more group we have to thank, and that is the videotaping and the photography was all uh, provided by the Illinois Policy Institute. The Illinois Policy Institute. Uh, they're going to make arrangements to have this on their website. They'll make it available for the university. Uh, they do a lot of good work on sentencing reform, on getting uh, 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 getting folks from prison back into jobs and all that. It's a great organization. Um, I'm one of their senior fellows. Uh, when my friend Ryan asked me to do that, I asked him if that was a shot about my age. He said, no, it just means you're not getting paid. Uh, but take a look at their website. They have pending legislation and things. So we want to thank the Illinois Policy Institute. I want to thank all of you for being here. And most of all, I want to thank my three heroes. at these things. He says, you know, I just have a funny feeling that Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley didn't have anything to do with it. I'm usually pretty good at getting statements out of people, and I, we've grilled them, we've talked to them. I think Alex Hernandez is full of shit. I think Rolando Cruz is full of shit, and I think Steve Buckley had nothing to do with this. I don't think that's his shoe. Again, I'm going to talk about the shoe in a minute. Well, as time goes by, so we go through all through 1983 and we go into 1984 and there's an, in March in DuPage County there's a primary election and in, if you know anything about DuPage County, the primary election is the election. There is no general election. Democrats are, uh, all six of them live I think in Addison somewhere. In any event, the, the, re, the Republican primary is it and the current state's attorney and the old and, uh, and a uh, defense lawyer, they go at it, they're going at it. And so Fitzsimmons, Mike Fitzsimmons, who was the state's attorney two weeks before the primary, indicts Buckley, Hernandez, and Cruz. And comes across like the white knight who uh, comes galloping through on his horse and he's, he claims he's got the right guys. And, and it starts out that way. And the entire, and, and the press was, uh, was horrible at the beginning. We see pictures of these three guys. It's Naperville, it's fairly, not very much in the way of minorities there. We've got Buckley, who's white, but we've got Rolando Cruz and Alex Hernandez, who are Latinos. And so, and, and you, can, you, can see that, you can see that there are Latinos in the newspaper, and then Steve Buckley, when he gets arrested, he gets his mugshot taken. He's got strep throat, and he looks horrible. So these three guys are sitting there, and every day I see that picture in the newspaper. I get, I'm in court one day, and uh, I'm, I'd been a state's attorney for a while, and I'm sitting in court doing civil work for a civil law firm, and I talked to a friend of mine named Cliff Lund. He says, how's your criminal practice coming? I said, you know, I'm mean, have trouble getting it off the ground. I'm, I'm pretty busy doing civil stuff for this firm I'm with. He said, well, would you like a criminal case? I said, sure, that'd be great. And he says, boy, do I have a case for you. And, and all of a sudden, the next thing I know, within about two weeks, I'm representing Steve Buckley along with Cliff Lund. And I'm scared. I'm scared to death because I'd... The only defense I'd done in, in, before in my life was representing a guy in a DUI in Cook County. It was a bench trial. And uh, so I was nervous. Now, I, I don't want to mislead you. I, I was a, I'd been a prosecutor, and I'd prosecuted murder cases, but uh, I'd never defended anybody before. So I, I was kind of new at this, trying to figure out what to do. Cruz and Hernandez were represented by lawyers at the, at the public defender's office, and we start getting involved. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see how how the deck seems to be stacked against these guys. And I'm hearing rumors in, 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 from people that are, other than John Sam, who will talk to us, but I'm starting to hear rumors that a lot of people in the, in the, in the criminal justice community are questioning whether they have the right guys. And uh, I talked to some DuPage County, or some Kane County sheriffs who had transported people back and forth over to Kane. They were saying, Something's funny is going on over there. I don't know what, what's happening, but I, I just keep your eyes open, Gary. And then I hear that John Sam, who is a deputy sheriff, one of the head investigators in this thing, is 
not believing that any of these three guys did it. And he makes the mistake of telling anybody who will listen. You're, you, he says, you got the wrong three guys. And he tells his boss and he tells everybody and his boss tells him, you can't rock the boat, we've got our three guys. And he's saying, no, I think you got the wrong guys. I think you should stop this train before it gets too far down the tracks. And they wouldn't stop it. And the next thing you know, John Sam is, uh, is transferred. I think he's trying to bust underage drinkers at the convenience stores or something. They sent him out and, and he's, he's, he eventually then, after a while, shortly thereafter, uh, resigns from police work and he hasn't been a police officer since and he was, as far as I'm concerned, DuPage County just cheated themselves out of a hell of an investigator. But then to the state's attorney that, you know, you've got these guys charged with this murder. I think maybe we've got the right guy. Dugan had already been arrested for several unrelated attacks, a couple of murders. Mr. Cruz was tried again and sentenced to death again, 1990. His first conviction was overturned because they tried two co-defendants together. They were sentenced to death. Mr. Cruz's conviction was overturned. He was then sentenced to death again. Uh, Alejandro Hernandez's conviction was overturned with Mr. Cruz. His next trial was a hung, trial, a hung jury, and then he was sentenced to death again. Mr. Cruz's was, case was ultimately reversed on Bastille Day, 1994. I thought that was interesting. He was ultimately acquitted in 1995. Brian Dugan is on death row. I want to talk about our speakers briefly. Mr. Johnson, my current partner, has been a lawyer for over 30 years. A graduate of Illinois Wesleyan, Drake University Law School, where he was awarded the Order of Coif for outstanding achievement. He was an assistant state's attorney in King County before this case started. After it was, he was elected the state's attorney of King County, and since then he's been in private practice. He and I have been together about 20 years or so. Tom McCulloch is a present public defender in DeKalb County. Prior to that, he was an assistant public defender in King County. Prior to that, he was the public defender at King County. At one point, he was working part-time, and he worked with our firm. Mr. McCulloch also represented recently Jack McCulloch, who has been in the newspaper, DeKalb County murder conviction, a cold case homicide, that when, you, when he talks a little bit about it, he said he would talk what, about what he can, a little bit. You'll see what we thought was over a couple of decades ago is not over. These type of mistakes still occur. Finally, this is my friend, our friend, Rolando Cruz. This is hard for Rolando to talk about. He was in prison for something he did not do for over a decade, much of it on death row, which I submit to you was not a pleasant place to be. Here's what's going to happen. I'm first going to ask Mr. Johnson to talk about the tortured history as he will share with you. And then Mr. McCulloch, and then finally we'll hear from Mr. Cruz. There will be time for questions at the end. If you would save them to them, that would be great. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Johnson. Speaking to the uh, seniors that are here, I'm assuming you're seniors and probably juniors in, in college. What would, year would you be born? 1995, is that, am I close? Am I fairly close? Okay, 1995. The events that I'm gonna talk to you about span 35 years, and, and David said to me, I want you to, Give us an overview of the Nicarico case. So I said, well, the Nicarico case went on for 30, and it's not still going on, but it, it didn't finish all that long ago. 35 years, there's been all kinds of litigation over the 35 years. Civil suits, criminal suits, um, all kinds of things have happened. And today, as we sit here in 2017, things are good. Rolando Cruz is a free man. The two, other, uh, the two other people that he was charged with, Stephen Buckley, who's my client, who likes to fly under the radar and is not here tonight, and Alex Hernandez, their friend. He said, I was talking to a guy by the name of Ricky Benavides, and he said he had something to do with the killing of Janine Nicarico. So when the Naperville police, and the, or I'm sorry, the sheriff's office hears this, they go out to Alex and they talk to him and they say, tell us about what you heard. And he said, well, I was in a car with Ricky Benavides and Ricky Benavides says that they didn't mean to kill her and that he was involved and all that. So right now they're thinking Alex is a suspect. And Alex hears about the reward and he starts thinking, I'm going to do some things to get the reward. So he starts 
spewing out garbage, things that lying to the police officers and spewing out garbage that the police caused them to be suspicious of him. And when they said, where's Ricky Benavides? Nobody could find Ricky Benavides. And so they're trying to find him. They said, well, who was present with you? Was anybody else there when you talked about Ricky Benavides? He said, yeah, there was a couple of guys. Mike Castro, who they found, who said no, no such conversation occurred in my presence. And Stephen Buckley, who they also found. And they said, uh, and Steve said to them when they talked to him, and he talked to him, he said, and I, I don't remember any, con there was no conversation like that, so, you know, it didn't happen. What they did do to Steve, though, they said, you know, where there's a shoe print on the door, because the Nicaragua court door was kicked in, and there was a shoe print on the door. And it had a pattern on it, and you could see it. And so they said to Steve, do you ever see, and they found out what kind of a shoe makes that print. So they showed him a shoe while they were questioning him. He said, have you ever seen a shoe like that? And Steve says, I have a shoe that's just like that. So they go over to the Nicarico house. I'm sorry, they go over to the Buckley house. And Mrs. Buckley, Steve says, Mom, they want my shoes. Mrs. Buckley takes Steve's shoes, wraps them up in a little bag, and gives them to the police. And they go off to the DuPage County Crime Lab. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the shoe print evidence in detail in a minute. But the shoe print evidence is if you took a look at the bottom of Steve's shoe, if you took a look at the bottom of that shoe and you looked at the shoe print on the door, you'd say, well, there is a clue because the patterns look similar. You can say, okay, uh, we should take a look at that shoe and, and analyze that and see if that shoe has any connection to the door because it looks like it's the same brand of shoe that was used to kick in the door. Then Rolando gets involved. He hears about the, uh, the uh, um, uh, reward as well, and he starts saying some crazy things. Uh, not as crazy as Alex does, but he, gets he, he starts saying things too, and they start homing in on Rolando. And there's a couple of dates I want you to remember with Rolando Cruz, because I'm going to tee this up for him. I, I know he's going to talk about it, but there's two dates I want you to remember, because I'm going to connect it up with the third date later on. And uh, Janine was taken in February, nine, I'm sorry, February 25th, 1983. On May 2nd, 1983, and on May 10th, 1983, and those are two important dates, keep those in mind, they interview, interview Rolando Cruz, and whenever Rolando talked to him, something or somebody was there to record it, right? They put a microphone under him and he talks. On May the 2nd, they do that. May the 10th, they do that. And there was a, there was, I saw, read the transcript of the statements that Rolando made. And basically those statements were, I talked to a guy who knows something about the case. And they go on, he goes on for a little while talking about that. So I know a guy by the name of Emilio Donatlin. He knows about the case. He knows who killed Janine Nicarico. And then on the 10th, it was somebody else who we mentioned. And those two dates happened. They drag him before the grand jury as they drag Steve Buckley and as they drag Alex Hernandez before the grand jury. By now, these guys are knowing, well, these guys are thinking, we had something to do with this. What the hell's going on here? And they're saying, we didn't have anything to do with this. Alex is saying in front of the grand jury, I did this for the, I did this, I talked to you guys for the money. I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. All through this time, there's a detective over at the sheriff's office. His name is John Sam, and John Sam is one of what I consider one of four heroes in this case. And John Sam is looking for three men. Uh, Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley all sued the county at one point during this entire 35-year period, sued the county and, and won a multi-million dollar verdict. It wasn't enough, but it, it helps. It was something. Some of the prosecutors and some of the police that were in charge of investigating and prosecuting this case were charged with various obstruction of justice related crimes. They were all acquitted. As you know, it's difficult to prosecute police officers and, and, and prosecutors, but they were all acquitted. Uh, and that happened during the course of this 35 years. There were a number of criminal cases as well. There were libel suits. All kinds of things have happened over the 35 years. And things are good today. The, the good guys are out. The innocent guys are out. The person who committed this crime, the only person who committed this crime, Brian Dugan, is serving a life sentence in prison. He's actually serving three life sentences right now. I think, Tom, they're consecutive, right? So unless he's a cat, what? He, what? No, they are three? They are consecutive. Okay. Unless he's a cat. 265 years. You've heard, well, you've heard that cats have what? Nine lives? Three lives? Yeah. Anyway, he's got six left. In any event, but it didn't start out very pretty. It started out kind of rough. And on February 25th, as David told you, February 25th, 1983, Janine, Janine Nicarico was taken from her home in Naperville, Illinois. Now you have to, I always say to people, there were no Nicarico cases before the Nicarico case because we hadn't had anything like this before. And it was every, every parents and brothers and sisters worst nightmare mom and dad worked. dad goes off to work mom worked as a secretary in a nearby elementary school 
Her daughter, Janine, is sick. They, she had two older daughters who went off to school. Mom's debating whether to stay home or go to work. She decides to go to work. She leaves some instructions on how to not answer the door or answer the door to Janine, and she's calling in all day as a worried mom would do. At some point during the day, Janine is taken from her home and uh, she is sodomized and there's, there, they find semen uh, on her and in her. She's uh, beaten over the head and she's not found for two days. She's dead and they find her on February 27th on the Illinois Prairie Path, which is a path, I don't know if you've ever been on it, but it's a path and off there's some woods off to the side. They find her naked body and uh, basically gash, beat in head. And, all, and now there's an investigation. And we're not talking about any investigation because this actually, even though the address is Naperville, it happened like a block outside of the city limits in Naperville. So it was a DuPage County Sheriff's Department jurisdiction. The Sheriff's Office takes uh, over this case, but they enlist the help of the Naperville Police Department, the Aurora, as Mr. Kamek told you, the Aurora Police Department, and even the FBI got involved, and they have this task force. And they're turning the world up on, you know, on its ear to try to find out whoever committed this crime. And David's right, the first place they looked was west. It had to come from uh, Aurora. And they started looking west. And one of the things that they did that I think is a, an argument for ever having rewards in a, in a criminal case is they offered a reward that started out at $5,000. It was increased to $10,000. Now, I don't know what it, that amounts to in today's money, but I bet you it's pretty close to 25, 30, maybe even more, maybe $50,000, something like that. And what it does is it causes young men to do stupid things and say stupid things. And so as the investigation started out, uh, Alex Hernandez is the first one to open his mouth. And he tells, starts telling his family members that he had been talking to a fellow by the name of Ricky Benavidez. Ricky Benavidez was uh, somebody they couldn't find. Let me start by welcoming the AU students who are here, uh, the law students for NIU, including my oldest girl. It's her birthday today. Um, <laughs> members of the bar, members of the law enforcement community who are here, I appreciate that, particularly my friends Lee and Kristen, who when the department chair told me that I'm responsible for this place being in good condition when I leave, I called Lee. And he fell for the, you doing anything next Tuesday? Because uh, yeah. No, what do you have in mind? Um, before I go any further, I also want to thank uh, Dave Dial, this is being recorded, the best department chair anywhere, who's my boss, <laughs> and Dr. Stephanie Wittius, who's on the faculty here in the Criminal Justice Department, and it just did a lot to get this ready for me today. Thank you very much, Doctor. <laughs> I see folks looking for seats, there's one of them. On February 25th, 1983, almost 34 years ago to the day, Janine Nicarico, 10, was at home alone in her home in Naperville. Someone broke into that home, wrapped her up, kidnapped her, sexually assaulted her, and murdered her. The DuPage County Sheriff's Office began their investigation. And I can tell you from personal experience, one of the first things they did is go to the Aurora Police Department, where I happened to be the police officer on the front desk, and they wanted to know if our investigators in, because they knew whoever did this came from Aurora. I said, what does it have to come from Aurora? Well, we just know it did. The Sheriff's Office began their investigation, and it took a while. But there was an election coming up, and it was a heated election because the person who wanted to be the state's attorney in DuPage County. The investigation was pushed, either directly or indirectly, it's always hard to say. There were errors, there were malfeasance, there was mistakes. On March 9th, 1984, three men, Rolando Cruz, Alejandro Hernandez, and Stephen Buckley were indicted for her murder. For the next decade and more, this case involving a criminal justice system took twists and turns 
that sometimes are not to be believed, or at least we would hope would not be believed. But unfortunately, these type of errors are occurring with more frequency than they were before. Mr. Hernandez was convicted and sentenced to death, along with Mr. Cruz. Mr. Buckley, who was tried separately and was represented by Mr. Johnson, was not convicted. He had a hung jury. Eventually, Mr. Johnson was able to make sure that case wasn't prosecuted again, based on his work. In 1985, the same year they were convicted, a man named Brian Dugan was arrested for a series of murders. Brian's public defender and his team of public defenders, which eventually included Mr. McCulloch, at some point proffered or made information